without further ado, we're now going to move into our wonderful panel discussion. Uh, today we have uh, some of the most bright minds of native country gathered here uh, to talk about their relationship with traditional knowledge and wisdom, and, as well as food and culture camps and, and other pieces as well. Um, and so uh, would our panelists turn on your cameras? For those who are able to. Oh, for those who are able to. <laughs> All right. Amazing. Um, each of you are gonna give your own introduction here briefly, but I, I'm just going to introduce each of you um, very quickly and uh, say a little bit about uh, what you're gonna be talking about. We have uh, Nancy Deer Attorney with us, uh, Ruth Miller, Lucas Swamp Dog Tyree, uh, Lauren, uh, and Jolie Valera. Uh, each who are going to be talking about different aspects of traditional knowledge uh, and, um, and wisdom. And so uh, starting with Nancy, would you um, be able to introduce yourself and share some about the traditional knowledge and culture programs that you've been involved with and how those have impacted you and, and uh, really just speak on that in your introduction. Hishje Songo, Nancy Deer Attorney, Jahaji Kudos. Hello, everybody. My name is Nancy Deer Attorney. I am Muskogee Creek from Oklahoma. I'm also um, part, um, I was born in Minnesota. My On my father's side there from Leech Lake, Band of Ojibwe. I, I was raised in Oklahoma by my mother, who is Muskogee Creek. So I was, like to say, I was raised in Muskogee. And um, one of the things I think that stuck out the most is when I got older was realizing how much my my mom and like her side of the family really really put like culture as a priority for us and um it kind of developed more as I got a little older and I realized that there were other people in my community that they it was not just that they didn't have as much access to it but they didn't have the opportunities that I had growing up and so um I later developed a a camp. It was called the Youth Enrichment Camp, and it was a culture sharing camp to teach not only Native youth in our community, but also like non-Natives to understand why we do things a certain way or why, you know, just to get a better understanding of your neighbor. And what it allowed, we did it for a couple of years, and I passed the project off to our youth council, our local youth council. And what it really allowed for us to do was to bring in, because our tribe is so big, um, a better understanding for like maybe if we do things differently than the, even though we're the same tribe like um, like another ceremonial ground or something but um, I was really fortunate to be re-raised by my parents and the teachings that I was taught and then the ability to give back that information to our community and to children that may not have had the same opportunities that I had it was really important to me and I just kind of look forward to speaking with everybody and hearing everybody else's points as well on, um, I think, I guess I can go into more detail later about the culture camps and what they consisted of, but thanks for having me. Thank you for uh, attending, Nancy, and, and, and thank you for that uh, introduction that you've given. Um, Ruth Miller, would you be able to, to introduce yourself and then talk about uh, traditional, a little bit about traditional knowledge and culture programs or other pieces that you've been involved with and how they've impacted you. Yachli do everybody, it's so good to be here with you today. Shivaik isinch ijich u den ina kanega shal kunkanash chayang as ninish itech u shiznaka Heather Kendall Miller shukta u Lloyd Miller shukta u kizje vena as ninish kayakilanda chikine kali kidiki. Um, my English name is Ruth, my Dena'ina name is Shavayak Isin, and my family comes from Kijje Venna, Lake Clark, uh, the abandoned village of Kijik. We then went downriver and um, lived for a long time in Bristol Bay, which is very close to my heart as well. Um, but I was raised here in Dehayekak, also on Dena'ina territory, uh, Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I presently work as the climate justice director for a nonprofit indigenous matriarchal organization up here called Native Movement. Um, but I've been 
Oh, active in, in climate justice work and all that that means for our indigenous peoples um, in a huge variety of ways ever since ever. Um, you know, I, I always think it's funny when people talk to me like I'm an environmentalist. I'm like, what do you mean an environmentalist? I'm native, those are the same thing. <laughs> but, you know, our relationship to land as, as um, Dr. Kip shared with us is a love story. It's everything about who we are. Um, and so, you know, my very first job was working against a proposed, the largest proposed um, copper mine in our watershed, um, would have been the largest in the world, the pebble mine. Um, I was 15 years old working for United Tribes of Bristol Bay. Um, a lot of that was um, teaching folks to, to give testimony at EPA hearings to talk about how important our sika, our salmon are to everything that we are. But my very first day of work, I did not go into the office. I called up my boss, Alana Hurley, and I told her, hey, I just can't make it in today. The fish hit the net and I got to go pick fish. I got to help clean. And she said, get off the phone, go. <laughs> and so this was always a story that was so dear to my heart because that was my first day of doing climate justice work, right? It wasn't going into an office. It wasn't staring at a laptop. It wasn't, you know, speaking at fancy panels. It was spending time with the sika, with the fish that feed us, that sustain us, that nourish us. It was spending the whole day and lots of days to come, you know, in the process of thanking them expressing our gratitude then uh, cutting and brining and drying and smoking them um, spending time with family being with community um, that is the core of what any of this work means to us and and to me that is um, so evocative of why uh, we do this advocacy work it's not just because we're environmentalists. It's because everything about who we are as indigenous peoples is tied to the health and wealth of our lands and waters, our animal and plant relatives. Um, and so, you know, even now moving from, you know, United Nations spaces and a lot of global climate negotiations, it's always our stories. It's always those moments of putting our hands in the dirt <laughs> or jumping in the lake or, um, welcoming our, our Sika home in ceremony uh, that are the most uh, important aspects of climate justice advocacy. Um, those are the pieces that maintain our spiritual, uh, our physical, our emotional connection to our lands and waters um, that remind us that when we advocate for our natural world, we're advocating for the thriving and the well-being of, of all of us. Um, so I don't want to ramble too long. I really am excited to hear everybody else, but Chickenick, thank you. Well, Ruth, thank you for that wonderful story and the contextualization of where you're from. Uh, Lucas, uh, would you be able to introduce yourself and then talk a little bit about traditional knowledge and culture programs and other pieces that you've been involved in? Sure. Um, my name is Shugnashkinyam Uila Kapapa which uh, literally translates to loyalty in a bad place. Um, the swamp dog uh, in English. Um, the land that I'm re residing on now is the same exact location. My fifth great grandparents helped to protect um, the lands that I work on. I'm a managing director of an indigenous led nonprofit um, we're the Monacan Indian Nation. Uh, we work with Yesa speaking people in the Southeast. Um, mostly we work on getting our land back. Um, my family held 40 acres of land through, uh, through a lot of trial. Uh, the original 500 acres that we kept was from two brothers, my fifth and sixth great grandfathers who fought on opposing sides of the War of 1812 for the purpose of a 500 acre land grant. Uh, that land grant was split between the children and they held on to it throughout the years as, it, as they were pushed out by uh, Ku Klux Klan activity here in Virginia. They started to lose the land and a few years back, I was finally able to put together funding to start buying our land back. Uh, never left this land. Um, I was raised traditional farming in a traditional way. Um, the first time I really left this state or left this mountain outside of some remote learning and 
going to school was to go to college. No one in my family had graduated from high school before. Um, my grandparents went to mission schools, but uh, we got the land back. And my overall take in it is whatever we used to be and whatever we are now and whatever we're going to be, it'll only exist if we have the land to be as a community because our culture is out of necessity and it is a necessity. So if we're going to exist as indigenous people moving forwards, we have to exist on the lands that spawned who and what we are. So for me, that comes from uh, this mountain here, Taka Shunkalasa in Nuniana Kumanipi, which means deer wandering mountain. Uh, it literally means deer appears and disappears. It's because of the ridges. So this forest uh, has about 160 acres of old growth, which we've permanently protected again through uh, legal easement against any pipelines or other development. Another 150 we purchased. Uh, the rest is surrounded by George Washington National Forest. So we're working with politicians to protect it as wilderness area. And those are black walnuts here. That one was planted, I believe, by my third or fourth great grandmother. The one in the foreground. And overall, everything I do out here is to continue the unbroken line. But of course, you have to have community to do that. So we keep seeking more land and to bring more people here. Very nice. I think uh, there is no more salient reminder of our traditions and our culture than our homelands, uh, than our, our places, being able to look around us and see the impacts that our family has had and the interactions that our family has had with, with the land. Um, Lauren, would you be able to, to introduce yourself and, and give us a little bit of context as well? Oh, okay. Um, in that case, we'll come right back to you. Uh, Jolie, would you be able to kind of contextualize and, uh, and talk about traditional knowledges and uh, their impacts on you? Yes. Manahu, Inaniene, Jolie Varela, Numunu, Payahunaru, Yesh, Tuli River, Nukimaru, Ibia, Tony Spoonhunter, uh, Imua, Anita Spoonhunter, Tsao Namati Nu. Hello, my name is Jolie Varela. I come from Payahunaru, the place of flowing water, um, and Tuli River. My mother is Tony Spoonhunter, and my grandmother is Anita Spoonhunter. Um, I am on my homelands now in Tovo Wahamatu, Payahunaru, um, also known as the Owens Valley, but Richard Owens never stepped foot in this valley. Um, and I am the founder of Indigenous Women Hike. And in 2018, we traveled our ancestral homelands, our ancestral trade routes, now better known as the John Muir Trail, um, but what we know as the Numupoyo, it, which is the People's Road or the People's Trail. And there's this very common misconception that John Muir created these trails um, when actually my people and various other nations along the Pamiru Toyobi or the so-called Sierra Nevada um, have been traveling these routes for time immemorial for thousands and thousands of years and connecting with one another um, and nation building across the Pamiru Toyobis. And it's been a really wonderful journey to travel lands and trails that our ancestors have always been a part of and to reconnect or connect to this land and to find healing along the way. And that is really what this journey has been about. And I like what Dr. Kip said, not only about the love story, which really warmed my heart, Monohobu, but about um, just connection to the land and the meaning that it has for us. And here in my community, you know, that, uh, that colonization isn't that far away. It's recent history. And a lot of people think of it as like 500 years, but here where we are, you know, it's the 1930s. Uh, it's when the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power came in and, and dispossessed us of our land and 
is responsible for the creation of three of the reservations here in Payahunaru. So it's a very recent history and they've tried to dis disconnect us from our lands and our homelands and our ancestral trails. And, you know, I, it, it touched me and I really rec recognized it when I first started traveling um, our ancestral trade routes or the Numupoyo. And I didn't see any of my other relatives out on the trail. I didn't see any other Numu people out on the trail. And it had me kind of reckon with this, this really recent history of removal and how we don't feel safe in certain spaces and, and how that history of trauma has repeated itself in our community. So what my organization does is we are going out on our lands under the American in, uh, Indian Religious Freedom Act and we're traveling without permits because these are lands that we have always been a part of and that we will always be a part of. And we don't need a piece of paper that allows us to do so. So we are going with our indigenous women and we're learning basic backpacking skills and we're fishing and we're gathering. Um, and we are, we are connecting back to these lands and we're being visible and we're letting people know along the way the true history. This is not the John Muir Trail. This is not the Owens Valley. It's not Mount Whitney. Um, so we are, you know, just letting them know indigenous place names. And we're also really um, learning and unlearning for ourselves. And along this beautiful journey with traveling our ancestral trade routes, songs are coming back. Um, traditions, ceremonies are coming back. So I don't like to say that anything is lost. I just like to say that it needs to be remembered. And so Indigenous uh, Women Hike has been a beautiful journey of remembrance and healing for not only myself, but other Indigenous women throughout my community. And, you know, I, I like to think that the healing of a community begins with the healing of women. And that healing is, is you know, going out into our communities to um, our future generations and to our elders and everybody. So. Um, I'm really grateful to be a part of this conversation today and Mana Hobu for having me. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you, especially for your work in reclaiming our spaces uh, with our language and with our stories. Uh, I think uh, you touch on something very important that native people you often don't see outside recreating uh, in those public spaces uh, and regaining access to those is, is something incredibly important. So thank you. Um, Lauren, would you be able to introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, I'm just going to full discretion. I'm at our casino right now on the San Carlos Apache Reservation because there's Wi-Fi here and the res is spotty. Um, I had to come down because of the fires. I originally am from or am based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Southern Tewa Territory of Isleta and Sandia Pueblos, but had to come down because there's fires threatening um, our inhabitants here. So that's just had to get that right off the bat. So I'm in the restaurant. If you hear some plates or something, just ignore it. Okay. All right. So Yate Dunjo Guasi. Hi, everybody. My name is Lauren Howland. Um, I also go by corn. I come from the big Roadrunner clan in the village of Wadi, Laguna Pueblo, the Gilson Wash district of the San Carlos Apache Nation, the Oyedo clan of the Hickory Apache Nation, and from the Naisi chapter of the Diné Nation. Um, all of my tribal nations are ancestrally and currently based in the so-called so Southwestern United States. Um, I am based in Southern Tewa territory, uh, also known as Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and that's who I am and where I'm from. All these different nations, a little red puppy. Uh, and I guess the impacts that I see in my tribes. Uh, so in Laguna, they've been dealing with mining and desecration of ceremonial culturally, culturally significant spaces since the settlers and colonizers have first set foot in this area. Um, we had traditional mines you know, but like, you know, only took what we needed for ceremony and it was a whole ceremony and taking that, you know, we didn't just go in there and desecrate and leave it for, leave it for dead. Um, but once the colonizers came over here, they took over these mines and started mining commercially. So 
in Laguna, we've been dealing with mining in San Carlos. We've also been dealing with mining here in southeastern Arizona and with the recent land grab by Resolution Copper. Um, they're a foreign mining company from Australia, I believe, whose intentions are to potentially create the largest copper mine in the United States. Uh, this mine is going to be placed directly on our ceremonial grounds of Oak Flat, uh, so protect Oak Flat. This is where our tribe holds our womanhood ceremonies and where we have like clan dancer ceremonies and stuff like that. So a mine in this area would be devastating environmentally and spiritually as well to our people. In the Hickory Apache Nation, our tribe has been fracking on a reservation since the technology of fracking was invented. We we're actually one of the first, I think the first tribe in the United States to actually take up on a fracking operation on our, within our borders. Um, that's not anything to be proud of. It's something to dismantle. So I'm actively trying to do that. Um, and on the Diné Nation, the you guys know that's Navajo Nation, uh, we have been dealing with trying to protect Chaco Canyon from fracking operations there as well. Um, a lot of people need to understand that the Southwest is one of the oldest colonized spaces in the United States. We've been dealing with colonization before the United States was a country. And we've been dealing with multiple colonizing governments since they've come over here in 1492. We've dealt with, you know, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the UK, and the United States, all the separate governments, also the Mexican government when it was established. And we've been, dealing with colonization for a very, very, very long time. And so I'm very proud to say that I come from a line of Pueblo revolutionaries and Pueblo people here in the Southwest. It's a very intentional thing to pass on to a Pueblo young person, their identity of being Pueblo. And I'm just thankful for that. I'm thankful for being here today. Um, it's very intentional and I knew my ancestors needed us here for a reason. So, they survived as long as they could and they still survived through us. And I wanted to thank Dr. Kip for their kind words today. I really appreciated it. Um, needed to hear elderly praise and elderly appreciation for us as young people doing this work, it's very hard. And a lot of times we get back, we get a lot of backlash from like even our own communities and stuff like that too. So it's nice to have elders who like actually support and encourage us. But that's just a small breakdown of what's happening in all my territories. Um, I stay pretty active in all of them. So I claim all of them. <laughs> so, but I, I'm an enrolled member of the San Carlos Apache Nation, if that counts. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I'm gonna stop talking now. Well, thank you, Lauren. Um, we have just one more panelist. Uh, Jay, uh, would you be able to give your introduction and talk a little bit about some of the work that you've been up to around water? Uh, yeah. Um, first, apologies for my camera off. Um, the Wi-Fi is a little in and out as well, and I don't want to be cut off. So, but I'm Jaylen Little Bear in Kuchanak, Medanak. Um, I'm Jalen Little Bear. I am from the Pueblo of Tamaya, also known as Santa Ana. I, I am a youth organizer with Pueblo Action Alliance. And, and in fact, you know, growing up, or, um, my first, um, when I first uh, after I graduated high school, you know, I didn't know what to do. I was just trying to look for a job, but um, I became an intern for Public Action Alliance. And um, the same as the earliest pa panelists, my first day was being at a protest and being in the front lines, which was really cool. And it wasn't sitting at a desk or bringing anyone coffee. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Public Action Alliance, they taught me, you know, the youth should be in the front lines. We should be at the table when it comes to talking about land back and water back. And personally, you know, it's just because we are the future leaders of our tribes and our nations. And, you know, it's a big, it's a big responsibility, 
but you know we take it with all our hearts and as youth we want to protect it and we want to be able to you know have it for our past generations because we think of our nieces our nephews our future daughters and sons so but yeah um i also in my home in my home tamaya i have learned how to make our traditional kilts and in fact my grandmother you know she has a class of making our kilts making women's belt and also we're learning the history of pottery so but other than that that's me i don't want to take too much time but thank you for having me well thank you jay um I think actually you and Lauren could probably tackle this this next question. Uh, we had a planning session on, on Monday and you guys spoke quite in depth about this, but I was wondering if you could touch on how climate change has impacted your community's ability to practice traditions and how you're overcoming these challenges. Uh, we're talking a little bit about the work that you guys are doing with water. Um, and then we're gonna bring this out to the, the rest of the panelists as well. Jay, did you, did you want to start off? Uh, I can start off. Um, so in Tamaya, um, um, you know, there, when I think our bridge was being built, um, they had told us, you know, to build a levee so that way, because we live by a river in our old village where we have our traditional dances, and um, where we do a lot of our practices. And they told us, you know, you need to build a levee so that way the river doesn't flood in. And my, pe my people, my, my ancestors were like, no, um, we're okay. But they did it anyways. And it honestly had harmed our land. There was a lot of, um, there was a lot of problems because there used to be a pond and then just because of how much moist, how much it just soaked up the water, it just became all dried. So there was no pond. Um, I've never seen it. I've only heard about it from my mom and from my grandmas about like the pond and the growing crops up there, but we can't even do that because of the levee. And, you know, there's, this is just, one Pueblo, because as in Pueblo Action Alliance, you know, we all come from different Pueblos, and this is just from my perspective as a youth and as a Tamayama. Um, I'll pass it on to Corn. Well, thank you, Jay, for that story. And like, it's often we hear stories like that where we don't see it as youth, and they'll be like, yeah, it was once a big old lake here, now it's gone. Like, wow, I can't imagine there being that much water here. Um, here in the southwest, I don't know if you guys are familiar, like it's a desert-like climate here. Um, so the tribes here have adapted our practices and ecological practices to in conjunction and relation to the land here. And so we've evolved like this over since time immemorial since we've been here. And so now we are facing here in New Mexico a very, very, very extreme massive drought. Um, most of it is because of colonizers, um, well, of course, impacting the climate, uh, fracking operations here in New Mexico. In New Mexico, in northern New Mexico, we have over 44,000 wells, um, fracking wells, and that's just in northern and south southeastern New Mexico. I think they have about 30,000 down there. And so each one of these wells, some of them are active, some of them are not, some of them are abandoned. Um, they each take about 800,000 to 2 million gallons of water each to um, even begin start, start to frack and everything. So you can imagine that times 44,000 wells over a period of 70 years has really devastated our landscape here. Um, traditionally and culturally, uh, Pueblo people are farmers. And so we have acequias that have been here and we've manage since time immemorial, since way before Columbus came across. And there's some of these water systems are still in practice with us today. 
Um, so we still have and manage and maintain these asekas and still have ceremonies held for them. Uh, right now, what's happening in New Mexico is, of course, we're still dealing with the fracking operations everywhere. Um, right now, Biden's executive order to halt fracking on federal lands is a little bit of a help and a little gives us a little bit of a breather, but um, it's only for federal land. Here in New Mexico, we have like BLM land, we have state land, we have a lot of tea land, we have like tribal lands, we have federal land. <laughs> um, there's just a plethora of different manage managers of each land base here it changes like from mile to mile literally so in the chaco area where public action alliance is focused right now and we focus on a lot of different aspects of like water and land back issues but right now one of our big focuses is on chaco canyon so Right now, what's happening there is we're trying to prevent it from being fracked, and there's a 10-mile buffer around it right now, but it's it's hard to keep that up and not also include, like, the air quality here in, in the Chaco Canyon area. We have, like, the largest methane gas plume in the entire world have, that hovers above our land base here in the four corners of the southwest. So it's not only like a water issue, it's an air quality issue too. So we started this campaign in conjunction with the current like land back movement that's going on right here now. Um, our Alliance Director, Julia Bernal, they're Southern Tiwa from the Pueblo of Sandia. Um, they're amazing and awesome. I'm so thankful to have their mentorship throughout this time in my life. Um, shout out Julia. They're on this call right now watching us, so I better do good. <laughs> we have this campaign going on and they started this. They're also in school right now for water, um, water rights issues and stuff like that. Uh, they're getting their masters right now. So shout out to them. We have the water back campaign. So we want this to be a sister movement to the land back campaign because here in the Southwest, we can't have water we can't have land back without water back too. So the land is important, but if we, a lot of times here, if we don't have the water rights to it too, it's no good because we can't grow anything without the water too. So we, the water back is to reclaim all unsettled indigenous water claims here in the Southwest. Um, water back is a step towards indigenous communities declaring their independence from the US empire it also means removing European occupation, clarifying water rights for indigenous communities, the application of indigenous feminist water and land management practices, and the resurgence of indigenous identity. As a direct quote from Julia Bonal, shout out, uh, we can't have land back without water back. So we hope that you guys join us in promoting water back for all your tribes, adjudicating your water rights, getting them back, you know, um, so we have a water back manifesto here um, as Pueblo folks and as like from a more femme Pueblo perspective. We are a femme Pueblo led organization. So we like to um, boost that, that opinion and that voice. Um, I'm just gonna read a little bit off of it right now. So the manifesto declares a Pueblo indigenous perspective of how our water should be managed now and in the future. So we have like five um, really declarations. So within the public perspective, rivers are viewed as mothers and women are the keepers of water. Waterways are spiritually governed by our mothers and have provided sustenance for what grows on the land. The resurgence of indigenous feminist water management strategies is the only way to protect our water resources. Oh, sorry, the camera went off real quick. Is the only way to protect our water resources and ensure clean water for the future. So the reclamation of unsettled indigenous water claims and rights being that water is governed by 19th century US water policies, um, which are like more than 100 years old in a lot of places and in some places older than that. Um, they haven't been amended for the past century, maybe century and a half. So water back works to amend water rights um, with indigenous peoples as the stewards and like owners of it. But we can't really own the water either. It's weird to us, but we're trying to play their game and <laughs> do it better than them. So that's just a little bit, sorry for talking a lot, but we have a lot to say when it comes to water back. 
you guys can go onto our website. Um, I think someone put it in the chat. Julia put it in the chat, uh, waterback at pueblooalliance.org. Um, I'm gonna stop talking. Well, thank you, Lauren. I think, oh, Nancy, yes. Oh, you're on mute. I just wanted to add something in on that uh, question because I think I think it's really important when it comes to even like with our culture camps when we're teaching not only youth but we're teaching each other and helping helping each other. Um, like my tribe specifically, we're very um, like herbal medicine people, and so we do rely off of whether it be certain roots that grow in certain areas. A lot of it is like kind of gathering of those roots, and so. Um, I mean, specifically for our family, we do have quite a bit of land, so a lot of stuff grows out there, but for, like, whether it's for our traditional dances and stuff, for our medicines, um, those things have to, like, certain people go out and hunt for it and do those things, but um, one thing that really stood out to me when you asked, like, how does climate change really affect our community's ability to practice, and how do we overcome that? And one memory just really stuck out this past fall. Like one thing that me and my dad do every year is we go and get possum graves and they're like, they're kind of wild. So you have to just kind of go find them. You kind of know a general area where they'll grow. And so you have to go find them every year. And then you have to try to beat the animals to them or hope you get, you know, you just, it's really kind of a hit and miss when you go hunting every year. And, um, one thing I noticed last year, we didn't get any because we went too late and all of the good ones were already gone because of like the deer and stuff like that. And so this, this past fall, me and my dad went out and, um, sorry, it's kind of hard. I lost my dad this year, but we went out and there weren't any grapes yet. And I was like, dad, this is, um, I was like, this is so weird. We came out last year and it was too late and this year it's too early. And and he just said something and he said that the things that we depend on, he said those things adjust for their survival. And we, for our survival, we have to adjust as well. He said, because, you know, and it, it made sense to me and it didn't really click that it was a climate change thing is that, you know, things is, things, the climate is constantly changing, but the things that we do rely on that for our survival, whether they be for nourishment of the body, whether they be for medicinal purposes, those things that we rely on are going to be there for us and they're reacting and adjusting how they need to, to survive. And him saying that is like, we're, you know, we're early this year. We'll have to come, we'll come back later when it gets warm or when it gets colder some more, it's not cold enough yet. And it was just like, okay. And we kind of retired in and unfortunately he got really sick. So I didn't get bar I didn't get grapes this year either, but Hopefully I'll figure out the time frame this fall. And I think it also hits an important part that when you go out with the people that teach you, sorry, when you have those opportunities that you really take advantage and you learn what those are because, because of how hard it is to find those grades that it, it just kind of, for me, it's going to be a really struggle with knowing that I'm in the right spot, knowing that it's the right thing, because then you don't want to get like a poisonous grape, <laughs> which uh, like obvious reasons, but it's, it's really important because climate change is affecting, it affects everything. And like he said, there, it's going to adjust for what we need is going to adjust and we have to adjust as well. And I think some of those adjustments come and some of the work that, you know, that, that you're doing whether you're fighting for water back and land back, those those are adjustments that maybe we make on behalf of the things that we need. And um, like I appreciate y'all's work, and I'm just just happy to be here and wanted to share that. And Nancy, thank you, and thank you for that and for sharing. Our, our condolences go out to you and your family. Um, can't imagine. Um, Ruth, I know where we are in, in Alaska. I go over to Tiona can commercial fish. We're seeing our fish runs return later and later every year and the fish keep getting smaller. Um, I was wondering if that's impacting you in Bristol Bay and how that's affecting the cultural practices and traditional knowledge of your community. Absolutely, of course. I mean, one of my personal traumas um, that I didn't 
you know, that I've had to understand the emotional impact of over time was even just last year and the year before, um, especially when we were having record high heat waves here in Alaska, we were struggling under our own wildfires. Um, just, it was relentless and, and me and my family went fishing as we do every year, hoping to fill up our freezer, hoping to bring back enough to town to share. Um, and the fish were dying in the streams. Um, they were having heat stroke. Um, we could watch them at the bottom of the creek that we've gone to year after year, um, just lying there, not moving, not biting. Um, it felt like our Sika had, um, you know, just given up. It, it wasn't something they could handle. Um, and it's so scary um, because, you know, what we say in the Bay, what so many of us express is that our, our salmon are our blood, our fish are our blood. They're not just, you know, our relatives, they're part of us. They're the foundation of our culture. Um, it's our fish skin that we use to tan uh, for clothing. It's our um, fish meat and fish oil that sustains us, that feeds us. Um, they're our, our greatest food source and, and that food source is no longer um, reliable. Um, so just, uh, actually I, I missed some of the preparation for this <laughs> panel because I was out of my homelands. I was in Krishnevena in, in Lake Clark. Um, and a, a practice that I did each of the mornings that I was there was our practice of uh, welping, welcoming the thika back. It's, it's our blessing of the water to return the fish to um, the streams. And our practice is to bless the water, to, um, to express our, our wish that it will be clean, that it will be a, a good home that the salmon want to come back to. Um, and we offer the bones of uh, the first fish from last year. Um, the first fish, you know, I think it's probably a shared tradition. The first anything is always so celebrated, shared amongst everybody. The whole community gets a bit and we save those bones and then offer that we return them to the water. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's a time of blessing. It's a time of celebration. It's a time of gratitude. But um, the song that I felt compelled to, to gift the water was actually one of our morning songs. Um, Peter Telefornsky composed it. It's the potlatch song of a lonely man. Um, and the first aspect of the song is, is a morning song. It's asking, where have our loved ones gone? Um, where, have our, where have our friends with kindness um, been scattered to? And it's, it's asking, um, you know, why have, have so many of us been taken? Um, and standing on the shores of Krishnevena, um, you know, that place is, is unspeakably beautiful, but it is elegant in the way it still holds our people's grief. Um, Kijik, the village I mentioned my great-grandmother was born in, was wiped out by the epidemics of 1902, 1903, uh, the entire region was. Um, they resettled in the village in on Dalton, but um, she and her sisters were some of the last children left alive. Um, she and her sisters went downriver, um, and in our family were told that they were looking to marry white husbands because their lives would be better. They thought their lives would be better. Um, it was just too unbearable um, to carry that grief of being native. And so um, she left at 17, um, had a couple kids around 18, and then passed. And so standing on the shores of Krishnevena, you know, as much as we have to celebrate, and we do have so much to celebrate, we have so much strength to honor uh, so much power that still runs in our veins. You know, that morning song um, needed to be sung there. But the second part of the song is a, a song of cheer. And it uh, reverses our words and says, our loved ones have come back to us with cheer. Our friends have come back to us with kindness. Um, you know, it's a song of reuniting. And I think that's the hope 
that we hold out for. Um, it's true, our seasons are changing and we um, are so disconnected with the pace at which our um, plant and animal relatives are struggling and racing to adapt that we can't anticipate it. Um, you know, we're being caught off guard. Um, and so our work is to make our homelands, our waters uh, clean and, and welcome. Um, we have to remember that, you know, as stewards, our responsibility is to make sure our lands and waters and airs are places that our relatives want to come back to, that they feel welcome at, um, that they can thrive in. Um, and so, you know, so much of restoring our salmon runs is restoring um, our connection as people to spirit, um, our connection as people to our community um, and to our food sources and to our cultural um, tenants. Um, and so I really, um, you know, Nancy, thank you so much for sharing your words, especially through your pain. Um, you have such a powerful voice and, you know, your words have really impacted me that, you know, our plants and animals, they're, they're adjusting for their own survival. Um, and I think bringing us ourselves back into that same relationship, you know, slowing down, watching those changes um, is the only way that we'll be able to continue coexisting in harmony and collectivity with them. And so I think it's part of holding that tension, of grief and hope um, that this work is all about. So anyway. I think you, both you and Julie touched on this same thing you just now and Julie in her introduction. And that's the role of uh, traditional knowledge and wisdom in coping with grief. Uh, there's this idea of soul nostalgia. It's kind of climate grief, the way that I see it. It's, it's missing the places that we live in as they were rather than as they are. Um, I think across Alaska and across native country, we're, we're dealing with that more and more. And so I was wondering, opening this up to all of you, um, where do you see traditional knowledge in helping to repair the damages that have been done by climate change. How, how do you see us coping with the grief of climate change through traditional knowledge and wisdom? And uh, Julie, if I could start you out on that. Yes, um, I guess if I can kind of say in, in my roundabout way is when I began to walk these trails, my ancestral trails, and started to connect in that way with my ancestral homelands, it deepened my sense of identity um, and of, of who I am. And that really did something for my mental health and my mental wellness um, to be able to go out onto the land and feel that connection and, and feel rooted to the land um, was something that was really powerful. So, in that way, you know, I come from Paya Hunaru and our, our land has been devastated over the past hundred years with the city of Los Angeles's um, theft of our water and of our lands. And I've gotten to go out and measure the groundwater with my mentor and elder and gotten to see the devastation that, um, you know, the, the water and the land being stolen has done to our communities. And I've gotten to, uh, a friend just visited recently and I was driving them around and I was telling them our water story and I was telling them about my elders telling me what the land used to look like and how green it was and how one of our ancient lakes only took around five years to be drained and just how different the valley looked. And I imagine it all of the time. Um, I imagine what it looked like as my elders have seen it and as my grandparents have seen it. Um, and then I worry about what it'll look like for our future generations um, when they see it. But I know that we're coming upon this big change and me even just walking my homelands um, with other people and connecting with our ancestral trade routes. I know that that's power and that's medicine. And um, just becoming connected 
deeper in that way to our lands uh, is going to create change and is going to um, inspire us if we aren't doing it already to keep on um, thriving on our homelands and to uh, help our homelands thrive. So for me, it's just this I idea of like this deep rooted sense of identity of who we are that's rooted to this land, um, which inspires us to keep on caring for it just as our ancestors have always done. And, you know, as they were talking about like adapting to this change that we're seeing on our lands um, and like, you know, growing with the change. So, um, if that answers the question, uh, that's that's what I'm feeling about it. So, thank you. No, of course, of course it does, and, and thank you, um, Lucas. Do you do you have anything to to add in on that? Um, uh, this forest here, uh, since I was a kid, we've always foraged for pawpaws are a uh, a, a subtropical fruit. There's acorn mast, there's, uh, there's ferns that we take the shoots from and fry them. There's, there's morel mushroom, mushrooms. We have blackberries, raspberries, huckleberries. You see over time, this forest here was managed uh, traditionally. So there's an extremely old canopy. And whenever a tree falls, we manage what comes up. So the forest is managed on a scale of millennia. So for example, I know if I walk two ridges to the west, uh, sort of where I'm, I'm kind of off in space, my mind looking that way, thinking about it, there's two ridges off to the west is where my grandmother started uh, planting pawpaws after a small fire. So she picked up the pawpaws, they ate them, they kept the seed outside, let it scarify, and then they planted in it. And as the overstory came up, she let black walnut come up, uh, butternut come up, uh, white oak because there's less tannin in the acorns. And so that knowledge helped to create a forest, which was really a anthro forest. It was a permaculture that provided for them specifically because it was close to this field that we're in, uh, which was built probably thousands of years ago because it's piled uh, dirt and organic matter where three ridges come together and then there's a, a mound, uh, which is what the word monokin or monokin means is mound builder. And so what I've seen from the knowledge that was passed down to me, I see berries that would for sure come in in August. They now come in late August. Or I see that you know, the migratory patterns of the eastern brook trout in our streams are altered. And so where traditional knowledge comes in is, to me, traditional knowledge is altering every single moment to adapt. We adapt no matter what. We survived the deluge of an invasion and we survived the onslaught of a genocide. And then we onslaughted their attempts at assimilation and to Christianify us all. We, we outlasted them trying to make us hate ourselves and then to have us see ourselves through nostalgia. The only way that we stay together is if we have a practical use for each other. We should, we need to have places to gather food and to adapt where there is a change, some of the lands we're buying back, um, we've acquired 200 acres in two years. And it comes from a profound lack of understanding in my part as to how white Western society works to a point of observation, to understanding the word you have to use to convince them to give you money, which is pointless to me because all I ever wanted was this place and so I've expanded from 40 acres to a place where all of our original lands were coming back and then we meet national forest lands which means nothing to me except that I know that in their minds it means something so I still live as my great 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 grandparents did I get as much of my food from this fort as I can but I know 
they faced uh, poachers and loggers and people attempting to mine this place. They used violence. I have a number of my family members who served prison time. I have several who are in prison now for murder. And it was to protect this land and their people. And so they've used whatever means necessary. And there is a way to take political will and get the land back. Sometimes you're better off not letting them know what you're thinking and just have them make themselves feel some assuaging of guilt, if that's enough. Whatever we have to do to get our land back and then for us to reside on it and to take care of it because the past stays with us and the land no matter what. But what the land is now and what it becomes is the most important thing. If the climate has changed now and I have more severe storms, I have to account for tree fall. So I have to account for how the deluge of water is going to, it's going to tear out dams that were there for hundreds of years. These dams are just, uh, think of a spring, you know, coming out of the mountain, they put stone across it to collect water or to slow the seepage of water. So we rebuild those. You know, as long as we've been here, we've survived an ice age here. We can survive this as well. And they're not going to change their ways. They're going to keep pumping fossil fuels until the last dollar is spent. So we as indigenous people, our power has to be in keeping if they have to have the illusion of control of land, if that's what they require for us to keep them away from us, then that's what we have to do. I mean, this is my opinion. And that's the way I've kind of gone about this is to create a place where people can come back and be themselves, just an indigenous space. And so if they come back long-term, that's what I prefer. If they come back short-term, maybe it helps convince one or two to come back. But our history is that they've pushed so many of us off. The ones of us that have stayed on the lands find ourselves alone. And that's probably the worst torture of all, is you keep the knowledge, but you don't have people to share it with. So I speak my language. Um, you know, I sit here and I go through my 20s and I'm looking at elders are the only people I can speak to. And so if I can't speak my language to people, then I can't interpret how I see the world when I go out into it and it makes it hard to keep community so I don't know I see climate change as inevitable because that's the course that they took when they left Europe their their intent was obvious and it's it remained so so at this point really we keep adapting and the only way we do that is by being together and by using the systems that work that's just my opinion well, thank you, Luke, and thank you to all of our panelists. I think now